The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. On last week's show, I introduced the persistent legend of the wandering Jew, a man who was condemned to live until Jesus' return. Some thought this would be a life some 2,000 years long, counting from Jesus' birth year in around 4 B.C. or counting from his death year 33 years later. That first anniversary has passed, and the second will come in the late 2020s, the time some Christians and non-Christians look forward to the coming of a Messiah. In graduate school, I encountered the legend of the wandering Jew and decided to tackle turning it into an audio production as a school project. The idea was to present it on the university's radio station, but we never worked that out. Anyway, I came across the 30-year-old tape the other day and thought it might be appropriate for NDE Radio for three reasons. One, because some NDEers, like the wandering Jew, long for death after experiencing the other side. Two, the question of not dying provokes questions of what happens when we do die. And three, this is a good example of how an nde -er, namely myself, can become obsessed with understanding the ongoing nature of consciousness, death, and why we're here. The 30-year-old cassette is not in perfect condition, and you'll notice some glitches as we go along, but a written version for rereading no longer exists. Um, I'll comment afterward on one thing you, you'll miss on that account. Anyway, here's my fictional first-person rendering of the story of the wandering Jew. The story begins in the present of 1989 and looks forward to an end times at or near the millennium. So here's part one of the wandering Jew. I'm making this tape in my cell on death row. If you can still hear this, then it's not too late. But we may be down to months, even days. If my story seems to ramble, believe me, there's a reason. There's a lot to cover if I'm going to convince you that I'm telling the truth. You see, if I tried to tell you straight out what's going to happen, you wouldn't believe me. No sensible person would. Anyway, I'm a storyteller. No good storyteller gives away the end. And this will be my last story, so please, bear with me. Make your decision when you've heard me out. I'm going to tell you some stories about the end of the world. The stories aren't new, but they're prophetic. Look at them again if you want to understand. Our past is poisoned with mistakes, and the old ways don't work. Only comprehending what we've done will save us from the past. Prophetic stories get nearer with each telling. Maybe they're close enough now to ring true. Believe me, these stories should sound familiar. They were composed by us all. They already live in our mind's eye. Even this one. This was written in Sanskrit. There was once a sage who became a hermit and decided to study magic. Eventually he learned how to enter another man's mind and he took up living there. He felt the feelings of this other man's body and, and soon came to enjoy the other man's wife as if she were his own. Then a great flood came and swept everything away, but he clung to a rock and was saved. After that, he forgot about his old body and thought he'd always lived in the body he'd inhabited. Then a great fire came and destroyed everything again, but he managed to survive. One day an old sage came to visit him and said, What are you doing here in another man's body? The first sage was stunned to remember that he'd come from somewhere else. He went to search for his own body and the body of the man he'd inhabited, but they were nowhere to be found. The visiting sage asked him, What are you searching for? Those bodies were destroyed long ago in a fire and a flood. You are here now. The sage thanked his visitor and loved him for forcing him to understand, for although the message was bitter, the sage could now see the truth. Your rational mind tells you that the story sounds strange, and yet we can relate to that feeling that there's something we've forgotten about ourselves. It's a longing we recognize, I'll say for example in these lines from The Merchant of Venice, In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. But how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff tis made of, wherever it is born, I am to learn. And such a want with sadness makes of me that I have much due to know myself. 
My life is a history of trouble, and it always goes from bad to worse when I change jobs. The last time it happened was when I took up teaching. I taught environmental science at Columbia University in New York. It's the reason I'm sitting on death row today. I had a studio apartment on the Upper West Side, 106th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, and walked to class past doorways full of sleeping homeless. I chose not to notice. Rainforest, full of deep, variegated greens, and vine trailers thick enough to climb. My memories of the forest floor mask the smell of subway urine, and parrots, feathered out in iridescent reds and blues, stole the show from New York Pigeon Drab. I'd stand in front of the class and teach the kids my fantasies. The rainforests of this world hold a secret treasure. They are the sacred heart which Mother Earth holds out to us. Look through... From here we get oxygen and profusions of plant life, animals and insects, with answers to almost every important question we care to ask about our needs in this world. Do we want to know the cures for cancer and heart disease, the electrochemical processes necessary to regenerate bone and nerve, the photochemical mechanics to harness clean solar power? All we need is the curiosity and the time to learn to ask the right questions. The time, of course, ran out. Thousands of species of birds and plants, insects and animals, gone forever. The chainsaws muffled the scream of falling trees, of dying capuchin monkeys, of herbs and flowers ground to extinction under the tread of bulldozers and backhoes. And then there's the oceans and the air. I had this photo from NASA, a vision of the Earth from space. Look at it. Earth is a luminous, liquid blue pearl, the crown jewel of the solar system. The Earth is four-fifths water. These oceans are her lungs. These waters are an organ teeming with underwater plants and schools of fish, with coral reefs and algae and plankton that are to Earth's lungs as alveoli are to ours. Dive deep in your dreams. Swim with the porpoise and the humpback whale. You are the generation who will hear their cry. You are the ones who will finally understand. But we use the oceans for our sewer chemical soup, nuclear waste, PCBs, you name it. Saturated with mercury and dioxin, the fish that remained became poisonous to us, corroding our immune systems. When the death of the plankton reached critical mass, the great heaving lungs of our planet will choke and die on the corruption. Even 20 years ago, the handwriting was on the wall, the floor, the ceiling. We chose to ignore it. And at the same time, we were poisoning our atmosphere. Yet there was no stopping consumption of fossil fuels, the slow-burning fuse of the greenhouse effect, acid rain, fluorocarbons in the ozone. Earth did her best to fight back. As CFCs ate holes in the ozone, cancers grew apace in humans, too. The UV light attacked eyes and immune systems, making millions of people more susceptible to AIDS and other hybrid viruses, until the dark vision of Matthew's gospel came clear. For then there will be great suffering such as never has happened from the beginning of the world until now, and never will be again. After a while, I couldn't face my classes. I couldn't play prophet of the bad news day after day. Well, who could go on confessing to these children in excruciating detail how the greed of their parents had wasted their world and their future? So I gave up teaching for direct action. A group of us decided to take the pollution back to its source, to the presidents and the CEOs who profited from it. We didn't fool around. We buried radioactive waste in their basements and backyards. We laced boxes of candy with mercury and put dioxin in their wells. Eventually I was caught. I wouldn't rat on the others, so they threw the book at me. No matter that they were poisoning the whole world. So here I sit on death row, sentenced to die in the electric chair. Let me tell you a story called The Conference of Birds. It was written by a Sufi mystic, Farid ud who lived in the 12th century. Once upon a time, the birds of the world decided to find a king. Their guide was a bird called the hoopoe, and when the flock had settled down to listen, the hoopoe told them, I bring you good news. You do have a king. He is known as the Symorg, and he is great indeed. But he lives far away, and the journey is difficult and dangerous. Some of you will not succeed in getting there, but I will help those who wish to try. When the birds heard the hoopoe's warning, they were frightened and began to make excuses. The nightingale said he could not leave his beloved. 
The hawk said he would stay in the comfort of court and wait on earthly kings. The duck claimed he couldn't leave the water. One by one, the hoopoe answered their excuses. True love will see such empty transience for what it is, he told the nightingale. To the hawk, he said, an earthly king is like a raging fire. Whoever hovers near such power risks destruction. And to the duck, he replied, a water drop was formed when time began, and on its surface swarmed the world's appearances. Do not pass your life in va vague aquatic dreams which cannot last. Finally, the birds agreed to go and find the holy Symorg, their spiritual king. Go, they asked. The hoopoe told them that first they would pass through fire and splendor. Then they would cross seven oceans, flying above a mighty whale. This whale is vast, and by his breathing he draws in the world. Three million birds they fears. Some drowned in the oceans, others died of thirst. Some froze on mountain tops, others within. And there in the Symorg's radiant face they saw themselves. For you see, in the Sufi language, Symorg means thirty birds. The king they traveled so long to find was, in fact, a mirror of themselves. I came to my teaching job by way of the priesthood. I was a Roman Catholic priest, and more than that, free love with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Was it wrong to feel passion for the mother of Jesus? I didn't care. Wherever there was a sighting or a sighting, I never saw visions of Mary myself. But where others had seen her became sacred ground for me. Guadeloupe, Lourdes, Fatima, Zaitung, Magigoria, just to mention a few. Sometimes she was seen in a white light, nearly transparent, wearing a crown of gold. Sometimes she was surrounded by doves of light. Always she was said to be beautiful. She was called Queen of Heaven, Star of the Sea, Our Lady of Good Counsel, Our Lady of the Snows, Our Lady Refuge of Sinners, Our Lady of Sorrows, Our Lady of Ransom, Our Lady of the Rosary, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, and Immaculate Heart. Almost always the message she brought was to pray, specifically to pray for the salvation of the world. And if we couldn't change, well, her messages of doom weren't lost on me either. Take her appearances at Fatima. In 1916, in Portugal, there lived three children, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta. Lucia was nine years old, Francisco eight, and Jacinta six. One spring day they were tending sheep in a field near the town of Fatima when a radiant snow-white angel be appeared before them and asked the children to pray with him. He then touched his forehead to the ground and prayed three times, My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. Each of the children experienced the angel differently. Francisco could see the angel but could not hear him. Jacinta could see and hear the angel, but only Lucia could see when tending the sheep when the sky was lit by two flashes of light and a lady of transcendent beauty appeared as if floating just above a small, sturdy oak tree. She told the children not to be afraid, that she had come from heaven. She asked the children if they would offer themselves to the service of God to help convert the people of the world to spirituality. Lucia, the one who could talk to angels, told her, Yes, we are willing. Then you will have much to suffer, but the grace of God will be your comfort, the lady told them. As she spoke, a ray of light streamed from her hands. They described it as lighting the innermost depths of their being. Lucia later said that it caused the children to see ourselves in God, who is this light, more clearly than in the best of mirrors. The lady told them to pray each day for peace in the world. Then she turned to the east, and the light that surrounded her seemed to open a pathway for her. In Incidentally, on the same day the lady appeared at Fatima, armed horsemen on orders from Lenin rode into a Moscow church with children. After smashing the altar and statues, they charged the children, killing and injuring many of them. The lady appeared to the children each month for five more months. I'll tell you the rest of the story as we go along. It was my dedication to Mary that led me to the priesthood. You see, I'd hoped that Mary, the Christian Sophia, would empower the salvation of the world back to the beginnings of time. She speaks to us through the book of Proverbs. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always in his habitable earth. 
and my delights were with the sons of men. Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. For my objectives are the issues of life. They proclaim the will of the Lord. Those who sin against me wrong their own soul. All those who hate me love death. Tens of thousands of people witnessed Marian apparitions, and yet Vatican Council II could not be moved by pro-Marian bishops. In keeping with their patriarchal past, church fathers decided to downplay the growing devotion to the female aspect of God. In the early 1960s, Mother Church was still only patriarchy and drag, and fiercely jealous of the real source of nurturing love. So I felt I had to leave the priesthood. But there was a time, a time long before I became a priest, when I traveled through Europe and the Middle East. And now, since you've come this far with me, I'll tell you something more about myself, and will come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and then he will reward each according to their works. I tell you solemnly, there are some of these standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming with his kingdom. I heard those words and had no idea they were meant for me. Not then. It came the day of the crucifixion, when all of us were afraid to admit what we had witnessed. As Jesus was carrying his cross to Calvary, he rested for a moment on my doorstep. I was terrified for myself and my family, afraid they would accuse us too and, and crucify us. In my fear of being suspected, I drove him away with the words, Walk faster, walk faster. And Jesus replied, I go, but you will walk until I come again. Do you remember? Do you even care? And will you want a reckoning for a lifetime two thousand years long? There's not enough forgiveness in the world to cover over so much sin. Life and sin go hand in hand. They are betrothed and married to each other. To live is to want. To want is to take. To take is to destroy. My soul is poisoned with time. As he stumbled away under the weight of his cross, I knew right away what I'd done and the punishment I'd received. My wife didn't believe me, poor thing. But as the years passed and she grew old and sick, she began to see that I would not be joining her in the grave. After she died and my children grew old, I knew I couldn't remain in Jerusalem. And so began the travels by which I came to be known as the Wandering Jew. On June 13th, 1917, Exactly a month after her first visit, the Lady of Fatima appeared to the children again. At noon, witnesses say there was a brilliant flash of light, and the children knelt before the little tree. The Lady told the children to pray. Lucia asked her if she would take them back with her to heaven. She told Lucia that it would not be very long before Francisco and Jacinta would die, but there was a purpose for Lucia to live on in the world. Then the Lady covered them with a rays of magnificent light, and showed them her heart. The children said her heart was encircled and pierced by large thorns, and though her body seemed translucent, her heart seemed real. She promised them she would return again in a month, and then she was gone. Less than two years later, Francisco died of influenza, followed by Jacinta in 1920. By the way, their bodies were exhumed in 1935, and Jacinta's was found to be incorrupt. It was examined again in 1951 and again was found to be incorrupt. It's a strange thing, this relationship between the body and the spirit. Christ's body became the spiritual sacrifice for the whole world. Now my body, cursed to live till the second coming, is condemned to die. Do you understand now why I fear we are coming to the end? Like my body, the world itself will be electrified. This time the body will fail. Believe me, I know quite a lot about death. I've had 2,000 years to study it while waiting to play John the Baptist to the millennium. More compelling than death, though, is the idea that we'll be punished for our deeds. Since that day in Jerusalem, I've wandered in fear that my sins have condemned me to hell. St. Michael's scales of judgment, in one form or another, appear in almost every culture that I've studied. Anubis, the Egyptian god of death, set the scales before Osiris to weigh our deeds and decide our fate. The Tibetan Book of the Dead speaks of weighing the good or bad karma on scales filled with white or black edged Sinvat bridge from which sinners plunge into the abyss. 
Hell has been the dark companion of my storytelling. Many cultures describe levels of damnation. Ancient Chinese and shaman stories contain detailed descriptions of seven or nine underworlds, like Dante's vision of circles of the damned. There are Hindu tales about the hell of Yama, the judge of the dead, who determines their torment according to their deeds. The Buddhist hell contains 18 levels of torture, nine levels of hot, and nine levels of cold. From Jerusalem, I traveled to the eastern side of the desert of Judea, to Qumran, where I planned to practice the ascetic ways of the Essenes, and to wait with them for the end of the world. They were convinced that we were the final generation, and they were in training for that moment when the Messiah would appear. I lived with them for ten years, until they and the Temple of Jerusalem were finally destroyed by the Romans. Their struggle with the Romans helped fulfill the first half of the prophecy of the Book of Tobit. They will be scattered over the earth from the good land, and Jerusalem will be desolate. The house of God in it will be burned down, and will be in ruins for a time. But God will again have mercy on them and bring them back into their land, and they will rebuild the house of God, though it will not be like the former one until the time... From Qumran, I traveled to a Gnostic settlement near Petra, an ancient Nabataean city carved into red sandstone cliffs. The Gnostics had melded the tales of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection with the early mysteries of the Tammuz, Adonis, and Osiris cycles, and interpreted the Christian mysteries according to the ancient symbolism. For the Gnostics, this cosmos, riddled with evil, would evaporate into nothingness once the divine spirit was released from it. I was there during the time of the magician, Simon Magnus. He taught there are two shoots, without beginning or end, springing from one root, which is the power invisible the inapprehensible silence. Of these shoots, one is manifested from above, which is the great power, the universal mind ordering all things, male. The other is manifested from below, the great thought, female, producing all the middle distance, incomprehensible air without beginning or end. The Gnostics saw Christ as the personification of the divine mind. They held that the body was just an appearance, a function of the mind, not of reality. Later, when I came to study Mahayana Buddhism, I recognized the similarities. They believe that Buddha is not a man who achieved illumination, but the manifestation of illumination itself. This illumination appeared in the form of a teacher, expressly to enlighten those trapped in the coils of their delusions. The Buddhists taught that the whole world was a delusion, and was, in reality, the body of the Buddha. Now, this is the same idea that Christ taught in the Hamadi texts. I am the light that is above them all. I am the all. The all came forth made other references to the d difference between appearance and reality. These come from the gospel according to Thomas. Jesus said, If those who lead you say to you, See, the kingdom is in heaven, they say to you, It is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. But the kingdom is within you, and it is without you. Jesus said to them, when you make the two one, and when you make the inner as the outer, and the outer as the inner, and the above as the below, and when you make the male and the female into a single one, so that the male will not be male, and the female not be female, then shall you enter the kingdom. And from the Acts of John, And lo, my Lord was standing in the middle of the cave, and illumined it, and spoke, John, for the multitude below in Jerusalem I am being crucified, and pierced with lances and staves. Vinegar and gall are given me to drink. But to you I speak, and to what I speak give ear. Secretly I caused you to ascend this mountain, so that you should learn what a disciple must learn from his master and people from God. With these words he showed me an implanted cross of light, and about the cross a great multitude that had not one uniform shape. And in that cross of light there was one form and one appearance, and upon the cross I saw the Lord himself, and he had no shape but only a voice and a voice not such as was familiar to us, but one sweet and kind and truly of God, saying to me, John, it is needful that there be one who hears these things from me, for I have need of one that will hear. This cross of light is sometimes called the word by me for your sakes, sometimes mind, sometimes Jesus, sometimes Christ, sometimes door, sometimes way, sometimes bread, sometimes seed, sometimes resurrection. Sometimes Son, sometimes Father, sometimes Spirit, sometimes Life, 
sometimes truth, sometimes faith, sometimes grace. And so it is for people. But what it is in truth, as conceived in itself, as spoken between us, it is the marking off of all things, and the firm uplifting of things fixed out of things unstable, and the harmony of wisdom, of the wisdom that is harmony. But there are forces of the right and forces of the left, potencies, angelic powers and demons, efficacies, threats, upsurges of wrath, devils, Satan, and the lower root from which the nature of becoming issued. And so it is this cross which spiritually bound the all together, and which marked off the realm of change in the lower realm, and which caused all things to rise up. You have heard that I suffered, but I suffered not. An unsuffering one was I, yet suffered. One pierced was I, yet I was not abused. One hanged I was, and yet not hanged. Blood flowed from me, yet did not flow. When I'd finished with my studies of Gnosticism, I decided to go to Alexandria. You must remember that I had to keep moving, or people would notice that I never aged and demand my secret of me. I lived in fear they would tear me apart like some goose who held the golden egg of immortality inside. I had nightmares of being terribly wounded, dismembered, and still not being able to die. On July 13, 1917, 5,000 people gathered in the field near Fatima to watch for signs of the apparition. They saw the children gasp and grow pale as the lady showed them a terrible secret vision. She then told the children, In order to save souls, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. She told them that if this did not happen, that a second world war would occur during the reign of Pius XI. She said, too, that Russia should be consecrated to her heart, that much would be suffered, but in the end her Immaculate Heart would triumph, Russia would be converted, and there would be a certain period of peace. Later, Lucia wrote the secret part of, her, of the vision into a letter which Vatican officials planned to release to the public in 1960. It's still not been released and may never be. I suspect that's because it confirms the medieval prophecy of St. Malachi that this is the age when the papacy will end. Here's where we'll end part one. Next week, uh, part two will begin the wandering Jew's travels to what remained at that time of the library collection in Alexandria, Egypt. He's on a quest to understand what other cultures could tell him about the end times and when he might look forward to his own death. There was one glitch in this week's show I should uh, fill you in on, and that concerns the telling of the Conference of the Birds. Since my original script is lost, I've borrowed this synopsis from Wikipedia. In the poem, the birds of the world gather to decide who is to be their sovereign, as they have none. The hoopoe, the wisest of them all, suggests that they should find the legendary Cymorg. The hoopoe leads the birds, each of whom represents a human fault, which prevents humankind from attaining enlightenment. The hoopoe tells the birds that they have to cross seven valleys, or seven oceans, in order to reach the abode of Cymorg. These valleys are as follows. One, the Valley of the Quest, where the wayfarer begins by casting aside all dogma, belief, and unbelief. Two, the Valley of Love, where reason is abandoned for the sake of love. Three, the Valley of Knowledge, where worldly knowledge becomes utterly useless. Four, the Valley of Detachment, where all desires and attachments to the world are given up. Here, what is assumed to be reality vanishes. Five, the Valley of Unity, where the wayfarer realizes that everything is connected and that the beloved is beyond everything, including harmony, multiplicity, and eternity. Six, the Valley of Wonderment, where, entranced by the beauty of the beloved, the wayfarer becomes perplexed and, steeped in awe, finds that he or she has never known or understood anything. And finally, seven, the valley of poverty and annihilation, where the self disappears into the universe and the wayfarer becomes timeless, existing in both the past and the future. Well, we are out of time for today. Thanks for listening. If listeners would like to uh, hear this uh, show again or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org and hit the Past Shows button. And for information about IANs, just go to their website at iands.org. And be with us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for Part 2 of The Wandering Jew and more NDE Radio. This is your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.